So let us look at the uh, the people, the groups of people who participated in slave trade, the groups of people who participated as the middlemen. So number one were the Nyamwezi. So the Nyamwezi, uh, they were from Tanzania and they traded with the Wemba and the, the Visa uh, of Zambia. So the Nyamwezi, they were from Tanzania and they traded with the, the Wemba and the, the Visa. So the like them, the Nyamwezi, they started it when they saw the Arabs profiting from slave trade. Hence, they also uh, started doing the same. And also the Chikunda, the Chikunda, this uh, the people, this were uh, they were the people. They were a mixture uh, of the Portuguese and Africans. Mainly, they came from Zambezi Valley. So, and they were the Portuguese agents. So the Chikunda. Uh, they were a mixture of the Africans and the Portuguese, and they were from the Zambezi Valley, and they acted as the, the agents or, or for the Portuguese. Then we have the Wemba. The Wemba, they were also acting as middlemen. So they participated in slave trade due to physical conditions of their territory. So their territory, uh, it had poor soils and no minerals. So the area also was infested with the sese flies, which prohibited the animal farming. So these conditions, the conditions we just said here, they prompted them to uh, participate in safe trade for economic survival. So the remember, they took place or they took part in slave trade because uh, of the condition of their country. Uh, they uh, they could not uh, the conditions could not allow them to farm effectively. Hence, they joined slave trade. Then there were the visa, the visa. So they participated in slave trade because number one. Uh, they had been defeated by the Wemba at Ruapula and they turned into slave trade. And also, uh, they were influenced by the Yao and the Swahili Arabs who visited them. So, the Yao and the Swahili who visited the, uh, the Bisa uh, also uh, influenced them to say, all right, these people are profiting from this business. Let us all start and venture into the same business. And also the Swahili Arabs. The Swahili Arabs were other middlemen. So these ones, they were a mixture of Arabs and Africans who settled uh, in Central Africa and they raided us and carried slaves to Zanzibar. So uh, number one, there was Jumbe. We mentioned the Jumbe area on, if you can recall, we mentioned the Jumbe as well when we were talking of uh, Islam uh, on the missionary factor. So his real name was Salim bin Abdallah, Salim bin Abdallah, and he settled in Kota Kota in 1840s. So this uh, Salim bin Abdallah, he was welcomed by the Chewa uh, in Kota Kota, uh, the Chewa of Malenga Chanzi. Uh, he was uh, welcomed because he protected them from the Ngoni raids. We mentioned these factors. And they, he was also protecting them from other uh, other slave raiders. He also provided them with goods, uh, goods and materials. Uh, you can recall a lot of things that Jumbe did in, uh, to the uh, people of Kota Kota. He taught them a lot of things and sent others to learn in Zanzibar. Also, there was Mlozi, Mlozi being Kasbadema. Uh, this one. Uh, he was a Swahili Arab, so he settled in uh, Karonga at Mpata, at Mpata in Karonga, among the Ngonde. So he came there around 1880s. So he came uh, to Karonga to control the route to the Bisa and Wemba country. So he wanted to control the trade route to uh, the Bisa and Wemba country. So he worked uh, with other Swahili Arabs like Kopa Kopa. 
um, salemu and uh, nama nama kukane nama kukane so the ngonde welcomed him for protection against the ngonde however later on that uh, protection turned sour because he even raided the ngonde for slaves hence uh, they did not like him hence his stay in karonga was very short he short lived uh, between 15 or 16 years then he was killed another group was the, the group of the yao the yao so the yao they came uh, from the east of lake Mahari, uh, north of mozambique so themselves they were also influenced by the arabs so that's why they came to look for more trade materials uh, and they uh, when they came to the southern part of Mahari, they were visited by the arabs and there then they also tend to be middlemen and they started to venture into slave rights. So why did the Yao participate in slave trade? Number one, they were visited and influenced by the Arabs, just as we have said. Now, also their Chisi iron workers, they went out to sell uh, their iron goods. Uh, then uh, they came into contact with the traders and they finally joined that trade. So the Chisi iron workers of the Yao they were making their iron tools and uh, walking far distances to trade them but uh, while there they could meet also the arabs who were uh, doing the slave trade as a result they also uh, ventured into that slave trade so apart from the chisi iron workers also the yao they joined slave trade uh, because the Yao society, they gave a lot of respect. Uh, they were giving a lot of respect to those people who traveled, and therefore, uh, many men they joined uh, trade in order to earn respect and praise among their society. So this one, it means that the, all those who traveled, who were traveling to the, uh, far uh, distances, they were given respect because when they came back, they were coming back with the stories and many uh, things. As a result, they were respected a lot to be the people who know many things. So with that, then many people, they were joining that safe trade in order to gain respect, to bring more stories from uh, far distances. And also, the Yao, they had better division of labor. Uh, in that uh, women, they worked in the gardens to produce food and this left uh, with men to go out and trade without negatively affecting uh, the food production. So you can see to it that the, uh, the garden work, it was for women in the Yao society. Therefore, men had nothing to do. So with that, they easily joined the trade. Uh, even if they go out, they spend a month or two, they were sure that the family is well taken care of. So that labor division in the Yao family, it prompted men to join slave trade because women were busy in the garden uh, uh, providing food, uh, producing food for uh, the family. Also, uh, let's look at uh, the reasons why the Ndevere or the Ngoni, uh, because they were looking at Central African trade in ivory and the uh, slave trade. But these tribes, the Ngoni and the Ndevere, they did not take part in slave trade. So let's look at the reasons. What were the reasons that prompted these people not to take part in slave trade? Number one, the Ndevere and the Ngoni they were assimilating people into their society in order to increase or to swell their numbers. The reason was for defense. They were swelling their numbers so that they are many. Whenever they go and raid others, they are uh, raiding in large numbers. So they did not take part in slave trade. Also, uh, wealth among the Ngoni or Ndevere, uh, it was a weighed or it was measured by the position of cattle, uh, women and children. So cattle, women and children, those were the measure of wealth. The one who has 
five women or wives, it means that that one is a very rich gentleman. The one who has got uh, 15 children or from five, five wives, he has produced maybe 21 children. Then that one, yes, they could say this one is a very, very rich person. And the one who has got so many heads of cattle, that one is a rich person. Therefore, uh, they were fighting. Uh, their economy was different from uh, maybe others. As a result, they could no, they had no reason to join slave trade because the slave trade could not give them uh, could, could not give them women, could not give them children, uh, could not give them uh, even the cattle. So as such, they were protecting their things that uh, which they measured as worth. So uh, with that, then they could not join slave trade. And also, slave traders, they feared to get slaves or to trade with the, the Ngoni or Ndebere because they were strong warriors. So, because the Ngoni were strong warriors, then uh, the Arabs or slave traders, they could not even come closer to say, we are here uh, to buy slaves from you. Uh, then they knew that uh, these people, they were going to, uh, to be a very fierce battle with them. And also, the Kololo of Lower Shire. They did not uh, take part in the slave trade. So what was the reason? Uh, the reason was that uh, Livingstone had instilled the morals in them and uh, the spirit of love. Remember the Kololo? They were the same Kololo of uh, Chief Sebitwani, if you remember, uh, when uh, Livingstone, 1851, now he visited the Kololo country. He was, dis he was saddened by a uh, slave trade that was happening in that area. Hence, he wanted to come back and uh, uh, open a mission station in the area of Chief Sebitwan. But remember, uh, when he came to uh, open that, uh, that uh, mission station, then his friend Sebitwani died. But he was received by uh, his son, his son, uh, Sekeretu. So later on, he was given some porters to guide him, uh, to go with him. Uh, that was uh, about 27 of them. He was given those uh, porters to be guiding him wherever uh, he was moving. So they were the ones who settled in the uh, lower shed. Now that they were moving with David Livingstone, those people, uh, they uh, uh, accepted, they embraced the teaching of Livingstone of Christianity and they, they accepted to it that selling each other is not good, it is bad. Hence, they did not take part in slave trade. So the Colonel of Lower Shire did not take part in slave trade because David Livingstone instilled them uh, in them the good manners to say uh, selling each other is evil. So they just held on to that idea. Hence, when slave traders were coming, they could not take part in slave trade. Although deep down, they knew that from where they came from, slave trade was there. And there were uh, people in their region they were taking part. But then, the, in the lower Shire, when they settled there, they did not take part in slave trade. Now, let's look at the uh, impact or of slave trade so let's look at the impact of slave trade so we are going to start with the, the positive impact of slave trade so number one was that it led it led to the growth of towns like Nkota Kota, Kasungu, Karonga, uh, Mangochi, Tabora, Ujiji so these were uh, the major uh, towns or the major areas where slave trade or slaves were piled up. There were those stockades. Stockades were like a, uh, the 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 hole. So we can call it like a hole uh, where we put we put maize after harvest. So they were building like a hole, a big hole. After collecting slaves from different areas, they were putting them in those stockades, uh, waiting for uh, for the dead to start now going to uh, to the eastern coast. So. Uh, with that then, those stockades were like big buildings it, and it was the beginning of towns because where there were stockades, that's where uh, the towns that we are mentioning here developed like Nkota Kota, Kasungu, Kalonga, Mangochi, Tabora, Ujiji. These were uh, the, uh, the towns started to grow and also slave trade gave a lot of profits to those who participated in it. So the participants, uh, they 
profited a lot. Like we are saying, uh, the Swahili Arabs, they joined this slave trade uh, because of the profitability of the trade. As a result, uh, they could not abandon it. When one way was closed, they were finding a means to uh, open another way. And also, it cultivated a culture of trade in some societies, uh, which has lived up to a date. Now, uh, in some societies, talk of uh, the Yao, the Yao, uh, that spirit of trade is just there in them. Uh, you can mention a town where you cannot find a Yao uh, in Ma. Uh, it's there almost everywhere. You find at least he's doing some trade somewhere. Maybe it is tailoring, maybe it is whatever. You find that they are doing somewhere. If you make that uh, that survey uh, from Chitiba to Sanji, you find that in almost every district or almost every trading center, you find at least they are, they are, they are doing some trade there. So uh, that culture has been cultivated since the time of slave trade. And also uh, it led to the spread of Islam or Islamic religion and its accompanying culture. So the culture of Islam uh, spread and again Islamic religion also spread simply because of uh, this slave trade. Again, uh, it led to the spread of new crops. So we talk of uh, crops like rice and coconut. These ones, they were uh, introduced by those people, the slave traders. So those are the things or the crops that we still grow up to this day. Also, it led to better way of uh, dealing with criminals or offenders in that instead of killing them, they were sold away and therefore uh, they remained alive. So uh, in one way, maybe when we say a uh, slave trade is bad, we have to think twice. What about those criminals that were maybe killing other people? Now, instead of uh, uh, killing them again, it was like also committing another sin. Someone has killed, then you say, all right, our law is, uh, says that the one who has killed, uh, has, uh, he has also to be killed. Instead of maybe uh, killing or committing that uh, sin of killing the offenders, uh, they were just sold away to say, no, all right, now we are going to forget about these people, let them go and work at steps somewhere uh, let them be there for or for their life so it was one way or better way of dealing with criminals and also it helped to get rid of troublemakers in the society they are in some societies they are troublemakers now and again now and again they are making trouble causing this trouble stealing that uh causing all sorts of troubles now the best way to deal with the, those troublemakers was to sell them away, to say, all right, we want peace now in our society. Go and make trouble as a slave somewhere. And also, uh, slave trade routes became permanent routes and inland roads, which led to the growth of uh, communication networks in Central Africa. If you take uh, the routes that we have, the roads that we have now, uh, take, for example, M1, uh, the same M1, it was it all started as the as this uh, the slave trade route uh, those slave traders those who were trading in ivory and slaves they were using that route now and again using that route and later on when uh, development came in now uh, those people or the government now when they started to plan for roads connecting countries they just followed the same so it was the uh, the beginning of the roads uh, that we have today. And also, a new race called Swahili was formed through intermarriages between the Arabs and the, uh, the indigenous Africa. So, like in the uh, land of the Zanj, when you go back to the Portuguese factor there, we said the, the first people to come to Eastern Africa, they were the Arabs. And when they came there, they dominated those islands in Eastern Africa, and later on, they intermarried with the indigenous Africans. Their intermarriage produced another culture or tribe that is called the Swahili. So the Swahili uh, is a, a mixture of Arabs and indigenous people, which was born in Central or East Africa uh, when the Arabs came. So those uh, were the 
positive impact of slave trade. But much as the slave trade had those uh, positive impact uh, to a greater extent, slave trade did not do well, did not uh, bless maybe uh, African uh, countries. So let's look at the negative, the negative impact of uh, slave trade. Number one, it, it caused depopulation in Central Africa. So uh, in such a way that it is estimated that about 3 million, 1 to 3 million people were sold into slavery just in Eastern Central Africa and other millions uh, died in the process of being transported. So you see to it that it depopulated the area. We talk of the time or when this slave trade was taking place, it was the time when population was already, uh, was already small. And with that small population, then uh, people coming in again and grabbing other people, uh, selling them away. So it led to depopulation of Africa. And again, it promoted tribal wars among, uh, chief, uh, among African chiefs through acquisition of uh, guns. So it promoted tribal wars because when those slave traders were coming, uh, they were bringing in their items, clothes, guns, and many others. So the presence of guns, it made that those chief African chiefs to feel secure and they were feeling very proud to say, now we are ready to invade others. So you find that they go to that uh, other area, also other, uh, those people, they also had guns. Then there were those tribal wars now. So the presence of guns uh, led to the tribal wars. And again, it led to dislocation of activities in the areas uh, involved in slave trade. So we talk of small scale industries, such as the crafts, uh, iron works, could, they could not be practiced since people were afraid of slave traders. So those, the culture, the uh, African industries, they were suppressed because people now, they could not go out to trade in iron for fear of meeting the, uh, the slave traders. As such, those African industries, they went down. Also, it led to destruction of African culture, destruction of African culture. So uh, this one, it is because people, uh, they were not free to organize themselves so as to practice the dances, uh, the uh, poems, folk tales, uh, because th this could make them vulnerable for uh, or to slave traders. So Africans, they were used, they had their culture. Now with the coming of slave traders, they were afraid maybe to be gathering. This village and this village will have uh, the festivals here. Now uh, those things were suppressed because they, they were afraid of slave traders to say, oh, should we gather somewhere there? You find that slave traders, they round us up and get us all. So people uh, were afraid, hence it led to the destruction of the African culture. Also, it led to the widespread of uh, famine. Uh, since people were not free to work in their gardens. So more than that, strong young people were preferred to the uh, odd who could work in their gardens. So energetic people, young and energetic people were the ones who were taken away. And also people were afraid uh, to be working in their gardens in fear of uh, being met with the slave traders. As a result, it led to the widespread of uh, famine uh, whereby people had no food, had no food to eat. And say the African societies, uh, their stability was diminishing. And also it brought misery, it brought misery, it brought suffering, uh, it lowered uh, the dignity of African people as people were reduced to mere commodities which could be bought and sold. So the uh, misery, suffering and lowering the dignity of African people, that one uh, you have to get it very right to say Africans now were taken as a property which you can buy and sell. As a result, they were not uh, respected at all. So it brought suffering, misery, and their dignity not respected because they were taken as the property. Imagine uh, the way maybe you are packing a, a bag of mess into, a, into, the, into the vehicle. 
you don't get it or handle it with the, um, with proper care because you know ah, it is intact, the bag is intact. You just get it and throw it inside. You get it, you throw it inside. So that's the way Africans were treated uh, uh, when they were uh, taken as slaves. So we are saying that Africans were reduced to mere uh, commodities that could be uh, bought and sold. Also, slave trade encouraged the spread of new diseases. Uh, which Africans had no immunity. So it led to the uh, spread of Af uh, the diseases. So these diseases included measles, syphilis, smallpox, because they were uh, jam-packed. Uh, imagine when going uh, down, when going to the eastern coast, they were, uh, they were tied hands and neck to neck, just as you have seen some of the photos or the pictures up there you see that they, that they were tied, hands and the neck, only legs were left for walking. And that, as if that was not enough, when they reached the coast, they were packed into, into the boats, a small boat packing people like maize, now starting the journey across uh, the, uh, the Indian Ocean or Atlantic Ocean. So it was really bad. Hence, there was that spread of diseases, syphilis, uh, smallpox, uh, and the measles and also it led to ecological it led to ecological imbalance in some areas of east and central africa as some resources such as the elephants uh, from which uh, most of the ivory was obtained so uh, we are saying that there was that ecological imbalance because when they were coming for ivory it means that elephants were the victims. Here we talk of people as uh, slaves, but also uh, take it on the ecology, uh, on the ecology, whereby the elephants now were attacked. So large numbers of elephants they were killed, which led to the uh, diminishing of uh, those animals in the wilderness. And also villages, villages and families were destroyed and broken up by slave raiders and never uh, be uh, to be reunited so this was really pathetic another pathetic story whereby uh, when you see your uncle when you see your father being taken as slave trade or slave trader it meant that uh, you have been separated from that relative of yours forever so uh, the families were destroyed and again as if that was enough because the slave trade took a lot of time. Maybe children were left. You find that your father was taken when you were two years old. Now uh, you grow, you grow, you become 18 years old. The others also come, they take you for slave trade. So your father maybe was sold to India and you go to America. You have been separated forever. And again, uh, decolonization of Central Africa or colonization of Central Africa. For example, the British colonized Nyasaland and Zambia on the pretext of stopping slave trade. So uh, slave trade again led to colonization of Africa because those countries that were competing for the partition of Africa, much as the others they wanted to tap resources, others they also came in the pretext uh, to say they wanted to stop slavery because it was a crime against humanity. So it led to colonization. For example, we are saying Malawi and Zambia and Zimbabwe, they were colonized by the British. Also, some laws changed for ways that if one family, one family member went wrong, the whole family was condemned into slavery. So in some societies, the African chiefs, they made their laws to say, all right, we want peace in this uh, society. If any member of a family has been found guilty of breaking the laws, it means the whole family it is going to be sold into slavery. So those laws were not good at all because people were sold into innocent people were sold into slavery uh, uh, for good for the crimes that they did not do. So it was really pathetic on that. So we have. Uh, uh, looked at the such things, uh, the negative impact. Of course, there were so many. So I hope with this, you will be able to write a very good essay uh, or you can discuss the impact of slave trade. So when maybe the question comes to say, discuss the impact of slave trade, 
that means you have to discuss both the positive as well as the, the negative then you have written a very very good essay on that now to this far we have come to the end of this topic just as i said uh, earlier on to say this topic is very brief but it is very important because it has got some aspects that even affects us that has brought even the impact that is uh, even up to now so it is really good to know about uh, the ivory and slave trade in uh, central africa so just as usual i cannot just leave you without giving you uh, this exercise so this is just a brief exercise because the uh, topic is uh, just brief i will give you a brief one uh, and as compared to the previous topic remember the previous topic uh, there were a lot a lot of questions but on this one uh, there will be just few so just as they are uh, you are going to uh, do them as usual so the first one uh, here it is saying briefly or explain briefly the law of the uh, the law of the following in the ivory and slave trade ivory and slave trade what did this following do number one the yao number two local chiefs number three slave the slaves the slaves now uh, number two uh, why did the chiefs lose ivory and ivory trade monopoly in the interior number three uh, in what way did ivory ivory trade influence the expansion of slave trade number four uh, state the two factors both internal and external that contributed to the high demand of african ivory and also number five explain the factors for the rise uh, for the rise in demand for slaves in Central Africa. Here it is an essay. Number six is an essay form. Uh, so it is supposed to be discuss, discuss the positive and negative impact of ivory and slave trade on the indigenous people. So uh, what were the impact of uh, ivory and slave trade in Central Africa? So just as usual, after you are done, make sure you forward these responses to this number that is appearing uh, here so uh, this number that's where you use on whatsapp so on whatsapp just as i say uh, remember what you do is you take a photo you write in your hand use your pen and paper uh, write and capture the picture because i want to see your handwriting i want to see the format the way you answer the questions so I don't type maybe on the computer and send or on the phone and send no you are going to write because i want to see how you how best you write so that when i give you feedback i'll also be giving you the advice to say all right what if you try it in this way try it in this way in so doing i strongly believe that you are going to be assisted so you forward them into that uh uh number or else you can use the email address so you have we have the email address here uh, where you can just uh, forward the scanned uh, document whereby i'll also retrieve and try to mark and send you back so uh, in this way we feel you are going to be assisted so uh since we have come to the end of that topic but the journey continues so in the next topic we are going to start uh, a very very good topic as well so this one it is really the topic it's like now we are coming closer to the modern to the modern uh, day africa to the modern day central africa we started with the iron age iron age people things like those so uh, if you can follow this history how it goes it's really quite interesting because it is taking us from uh, uh, the like the ancient times and we are coming closer uh, to the uh, modern period so uh, after slave trade let's look at the uh, british how the british uh, occupied so we are going to look at the uh, the european occupation and administration of central africa we have just mentioned if you can just recall we have just mentioned that the slave trade led to the colon colonization now after uh, slave trade or the british or the europeans they came in order to stop slave trade 
But now, how did they occupy uh, this land in Central Africa? And after they occupied, how did they administer? What was their system of administration on those local people? So it is a wonderful, wonderful topic. So since Central Africa, we talk of uh, Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe, Northern Rhodesia, which is uh, Zambia, and Nyasaland, which is our Malawi. Therefore, we are going to start by uh, looking at Southern Rhodesia, how the European occupied and administered Southern Rhodesia. So we'll start with that. So this one, it will be a very, very good topic as well when we look at Southern Rhodesia. Then the next topic, we're going to look at the major theme, uh, theme is the occupation of the European in Central Africa. But our major topic will be now centering on Northern Rhodesia. Then the other part, uh, the same theme, and the topic will be looking at the uh, Nyasaland. Then we have come to the end of this uh, theme. Uh, but the, we'll have three topics on that one. So uh, get ready for that because it is a quite a wonderful, wonderful topic. So you can check out for this topic again because it is already there on the DVD. So check out for your DVD uh, because it is just waiting for you. So until next time, thank you so much. Thank you.